Welcome my brothers and sisters to tonight's talk. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless you all and to make you of those who are gifted with the understanding of his deen, to make us of those who apply what we learn and to make us a cause for guidance for others. My brothers, the hadith that we're going to talk about tonight, I will mention it in Arabic and then we'll begin with it. عن الحسن بن علي سبط رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وريحانته قال حفظت من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح الحسن بن علي who was also known as Abu Muhammad سبط refers to the grandson from the daughter. He said that I heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, leave what you are in doubt of to that which you are not in doubt of. Before I move on to talk about this hadith, just a little bit about Al-Hasan bin Ali radiyallahu anhuma. Al-Hasan, he was born year three after Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One year before Al-Husayn. He grew up in the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and was raised to be a regular to the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So from his very, very, very early days, he was blessed with the companionship of Rasulullah besides to being a relative of his and also of being raised by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the early years and the companions collectively. So he had a lot of great virtues, this honorable companion who is from the family household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's from the household of the Prophet. He became the Khalifa after Ali ibn Abi Talib died and he gave up on his position in order to make peace between the Muslims. And that was truly what happened. It caused a lot of peace. And this is what Rasulullah once said about him. He said, my son is a Sayyid. He's a master. He's a leader. He's a chief. And he will cause peace between two groups of the Muslims. And he only narrated from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 13 ahadith. 13. That's all he narrated. But this is not any reason why we'll belittle him. Despite the fact he directly narrates 13 ahadith, he's also still known to be from the great scholars who taught so much knowledge and passed it on to us. And the companions used to benefit from him. And the students of the companions used to benefit from him. He died in 50 after Hijrah at the age of 46 and was buried in Al Baqiya in Medina Al Munawwar. Now, this hadith, my brothers, is a very important hadith. It settles so many of the differences and it causes the person to have direction even while he's in doubt. And even when you're confused, this hadith teaches you how to get out of confusion. By leaving that which you're in doubt of to what you are not in doubt of. Now whenever a person applies this hadith, he will be in a state of psychological well-being. He'll be at peace. He doesn't have this struggle with himself. And also he will be gifted with inner peace with inner peace. Because the continuation of the hadith describes that 
The good is what causes the soul and the inner person to be relaxed. So by applying this command, you get into a state of inner peace. Now let's talk about this and get into detail about it. Now, the word Rasulullah, the command of Rasulullah, leave what you're in doubt of. Does it indicate obligation or recommendation? Who would like to share the answer with me here? Is it a sign of, is it the command here? Is it to indicate that which is obligatory or that which is recommended? Recommended. recommended. That is the most correct view, that it's, it's recommended to do this. And this is what al Manawi he describes, and this seems to be the most correct view, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Now, let's take some examples from the Sahaba and how they applied this. Once Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, he had some food given to him. And after he ate it, he found out that this food was from the earnings of the haram in the pre-Islamic times. You know, the individual who offered him the food made this money unlawfully in the pre-Islamic times. He said to Abu Bakr, he said, I made this, I got this earnings from Kahana, from fortune telling that I did in the pre-Islamic times. He said, despite the fact I'm not a good fortune teller and I can't perfect them, I can't do it properly like the real ones do it, despite the fact it's all wrong, it's all haram, it's all falsehood. But he said, I did not know how to do it and I pretended to know how to do fortune telling. So I got paid for it. And this is from it, this food. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq added his great cautiousness from the haram. He forced himself to vomit. Despite the fact from an Islamic perspective, from a ruling perspective, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq wasn't required to do so. But his cautiousness caused him to go to that extent of freeing himself of that which he is in doubt of. <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once, while he was at home in his house, he was about to eat a date. And as he reached into his mouth, he remembered that it could be from the man, from the, the charity that was given to be passed on. And Rasulullah wasn't allowed to eat from charity. They're not allowed to, prophets, and he wasn't allowed to. So he removed it out of the fee of what? That it is from the charity. He wasn't certain. So this is, a, this is just an example from Rasulullah, an example from Abu Bakr. Abu Dhar, he said, From the perfection and the greatness of taqwa is that an individual leaves some of that which is halal out of the possibility of the haram being in it. We're not saying to be doubtful for no reason. No, when there is doubt, he said from the perfection of your taqwa and human is that you leave it out of your cautiousness. And from what has been narrated to us is an incredible story that Rasulullah tells us about. And this is the story where he said that once a man bought from another man a property, a real estate. And that person who bought the property, the purchaser, after they had exchanged and he took the money and it's been, it's been settled, he found in his house some treasure, some gold. So he went to the person who sold him the house and he said to him that I found this in my house and it doesn't belong to me. So the man replied to him saying, no, I sold you the house and what is in it. So they will both dispute and a judge will decree between them and decide that who, do you, he will ask, do you have children? They said, yeah, they will reply yes. Or they did reply yes, this story happened. And there's one that's it's similar that happens in the, in, as a sign of the hour. But this one was mentioned in the 
uh, form of the past that it happened. So it was said to both of them, do you have children? They replied, yes. The judge said to them, marry off your children with this money. Now this was left by both sides out of their cautiousness, out of the fear that it's not theirs. So they left it. The one who bought the house, he did not agree with him on that thing or hasn't been mentioned. And the one who sold it was under the impression that I sold the house and what's in it. So it shows you an example on how far people will go where there is reasons to doubt, where there are reasons to doubt. My brothers and sisters in Islam, it's important to understand that this ruling requires understanding. What I mean by that? A person should not be by default someone who allows doubt to creep into him and as a result he leaves things and he moves on in his life not wanting to learn and saying I'm doubtful, I'm doubtful, I'm doubtful, I'm doubtful, I'm doubtful and causing his life to be nothing but prohibitions and disallowances. This is not the intention of the hadith. Rather what is intended from the hadith is that where the person can't reach the ruling for any reason or it's one of the topics where there are differences and there is doubt to stay away from it, out of doubt. <coughs> also, it requires a great understanding at times to the best of the two goods. When you have two goods, it requires to apply this ruling in the best way, you need to know the best of the two goods. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, تمام الورع أن يعلم الإنسان خير الخيرين وشر الشرين The completion of wara and cautiousness and the perfection of cautiousness <laughs> is that the individual knows the best of the two goods and the worst of the two bads. And he goes on to apply this ruling accordingly. Let's take an example. Let's say there is let's let's say there is a Muslim leader who is in a state of jihad. And he's a Muslim and it's known and he's shown the signs of it and all that. And then the time he's in jihad. And then you had a, now you were commanded to follow him or not. But this person is known to be a person who has bid'ah or has or it's in a state where he oppresses others, but he's still a Muslim. Ibn Taymiyyah gives an example that to know the best of the two is in this situation. Should you follow him or not? What would your answer be, brothers? Depends what he's going for. You're wrong. The best of the two is would you allow the kuffar to be superior over the Muslims in that state? Would you allow them to be in a state where they could kill and remove the leader and then the Muslims are in a state? of loss of leadership? No. So therefore, knowing the best of the two goods here, as Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, is to fight under his banner so long that he is yani, known to be a Muslim. Are you understanding the situation? Another example. Our brothers at times, with the excuse that he is a person of bid'ah, of innovation, they go on to leave the Jama'ah altogether. They leave the mosque altogether, and as a result, what happens? The mosques are abandoned, the people of Bid'ah rise, and the people of Sunnah decrease, and therefore, he has done the worst of the two, and left the best of the two. Now we're talking here where the bid'ah doesn't bring the person out of the fold of Islam. To know here the situation, what up? Cautiousness. Should I? Shouldn't I? This is a situation where it requires knowledge, requires understanding. And I say this to you, my brothers and sisters. The more the person learns, 
the more he realizes the, the, the areas of doubt. Believe me. Yes, the more he grows in certainty, but the more he realizes the, the, the dangers of doubt, and he will know how to deal with it. And he will judge in a more safer way. <laughs> Let's take another example, my brothers, and I hope these points are clear. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, once he walked past a group of soldiers who were drinking alcohol. He, and he went quiet. And Ibn Taymiyyah was known to be someone who would call to good and to be evil. And he wasn't that type that would shy out and he was known to be someone who's, who's firm on this. So his student told him, why don't you speak to them? Why don't you advise them? He said, leave them. Because when they're drinking, they're occupied from killing. Of course, now we're not saying that we will go on to assume the same for everyone who drinks alcohol. No. But he understood from knowing the hand, the state of the individuals, that here we have two bags, killing versus drinking. Of course, drinking would lead to killing, but it's still weaker. He said that weakness is better than strength at that time for them. So he went quiet. And this is something that you are required, my brothers, to learn about, to further your knowledge about knowing of the best of the two goods and the worst of the two bads. We move on also, my brothers, to say that this hadith is one of the evidences to the five major principles of Sharia. What do we mean by that? There are qawaid, we call it in Arabic qawaid, al-shari'iyya, the Islamic rulings. What the ulama have done, they've derived from the ahadith general lessons and general principles that can be used to be the basis for rulings do, don't, how to judge, and so on. Let's take an example. One of, the, one of the main principles of Sharia, one of the five major ones, is for example, the principle of darurat tubihul mahburat. Necessities dictates exceptions. This is a general ruling, derived from the ayat and the ahadith. From the ayat, from an iturra ghayra baadi wa la aadi fala ithma alayhi. Okay? Now, this ruling is general. It tends to work as a principle to be applied to all necessities. Does it make sense? Another one, which is a branch, not a main principle. The necessities are to be taken within limits. So, wherever there's a necessity and the exception comes in, the exception shouldn't be taken all together where the ruling is removed, no. The exception should be taken with limitation to what's needed. So going back, these principles, for example, darurat, tubihul mahdurat, al yaqeen la yazulu bil shak, okay, al ibratu bil maqasid, wal ma'ani, and so on, are derived from ahadith and verses and they tend to work very beneficial in rulings. This hadith that I shared with you now, that is, leave what you're in doubt of to that which you are not in doubt of, is a proof to one of the major principles, and that is, Al yaqeen la yazulu bil shak. Al yaqeen la yazulu bil shak. Certainty cannot be removed with doubt. I repeat, certainty cannot be removed with doubt. Meaning, that if you know something for sure, you cannot leave that which is certain to you because of something that is not proven for sure, that is doubtful. And this is what the Hadith really teaches you. Leave what you're in doubt of to that which you're not in doubt of. And it means stick to what you're certain of and leave the doubtful matters. 
Are you understanding that? And this is a very important principle in the Sharia. And there's so much other ahadith that prove it to be an important one. So for an example, to apply that principle and to apply this hadith, there's the ruling regarding purification. A person, he knows for sure he's got, he, he did wudu. He's certain 100% he did wudu. But there's doubt. Did he lose his wudu or not? There's doubt. But what he's sure about is what? He's got wudu. Based on this hadith, how will he react? Would he have to, would he have to do, redo his wudu? Well, he can stick to the main uh, principle that is, leave what you're in doubt of to that which you're not in doubt of. Answer me. He will stick to the main principle that he's pure. It's up to him if he wants to go and do wudu there out of yani, uh, precaution also. But really the intention is going to be there, not because he's lost wudu, but to be certain. Are you understanding me? Are you understanding that? Right. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he teaches us that if a person feels something in his prayer that's similar to letting air out, he should, he should not leave his salah, not unless he smells or hears a sound. So in your prayer you felt something, you're not sure. If you didn't smell it, you didn't hear it, you continue your prayer. Because smell tends to be a way to be certain. Hear, hearing is a way to become certain. So you're going to leave the prayer there because of certainty that came to you. And the same thing will apply to many, many rulings. Whether we're talking about contracts, or whether we're talking about uh, dealings between people, and so on. You do not go on to assume things to be as you wish, no. You will go off what you are more certain about. Tayyip. We move on now to an important one. And that is this hadith is a base or an evidence that leaving that which scholars differed about to that which they didn't differ about is recommended. Mean, do you know that this topic, there's differences about it. Is it halal or haram? Do you know, for sure, there's some of them are saying this contract is halal, others say it's haram. Here, to stay out of doubt, it is better for you to avoid all that to get altogether. Why? Because this is what the hadith is advising you. Leave what you're in doubt of. But here it's very important to understand, and I hope these points are coming clear into your mind. My brothers, it's important to understand, at the end of the day, such principles, such talks, help in giving you direction in life. And you should really set yourself to learn these principles and understand it correctly. Don't set yourself to be that individual who simply wants hyped up uh, talks and lessons, and all he wants to be is laughing and crying. Set yourself to be a real, genuine seeker of knowledge who is given direction, who can learn that which will aid him in his day-to-day -day life, not only that which would make him at that moment feel good. And these principles are very important. The one I want to share with you now, now this hadith is an indication that a person should leave that which is doubtful to that which is not doubtful. But this should not be taken in general. Meaning, this should not be done where there's a hadith that's clear, black and white about it. And there's the, the ulama, despite the fact they differed, they've got different statements, there's a hadith that exists. Now when that hadith exists, and it reaches you, and it's based on correct understanding that it reaches you, it doesn't matter here all their differences, what they said, you would leave that to what is proven to you, and you will apply it. Are you understanding this? Because at the end of the day, the haqq is in that which is according to the evidences. Quran and Sunnah, based on the correct understanding, which is the understanding of who? 
the Salaf al Salih. Are we understanding this topic? So where a person has differences and doubts, and it's confusing. Sahih is left, he is commanded there, for example, to leave the doubtful matter. Let's say it's an allowance, it's a ruqsa. Now, to leave the doubtful here is not to take that ruqsa, not to take that allowance. But let's say, let's prove that the hadith says that you are allowed to take this allowance. There, it doesn't matter how much they differ. You will take the words of Rasulullah so long that you have the correct understanding of it. And this is something that you will learn more when you're studying fiqh according to the traditional way, not the contemporary way that is pretty much giving you the surface of it, giving you the very crisp of it, the top, and not giving you the in depth of it. You'll find it. When you study this, you'll find it. Play. We move on to the other one, and that is leaving the doubtful matters is to the one or should not be done in a way of pick and choose. Meaning, an individual could be someone who is careless to so many things, but in one specific topic he wants to be now cautious. This person is not the one who is hadith applies to. This person is not the one who will be rewarded for that type of cautiousness. Because Islam is not about pick and choose. It's not about that. Umar ibn Umar, he had a person from the people of Iraq coming to him asking, is the blood of the mosquito pure or impure? He said, what a, what a, what a question. And he asked why he said that. He said they didn't differ about the blood of Al Hussein being lawful, and they are differing now is the blood of the mosquito impure. They didn't differ about his blood being pure, but now they want to differ about a mosquito. So to him it was a contradiction. And what a head, what a way of thinking. You go and do the major, 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 major sins. And then when it comes to the minor topics, you want to be all pick and choose. This is nothing special. This is nothing but a sign of an individual being someone who is pick and choose. Unfortunately, an individual might go on to leave a doubtful topic. For example, to some wearing black is doubtful. I mean it. To some people, they say you should not wear a, hat black, a black hat. I'm not picking anyone who's wearing one because I'm not against the person. Not unless there is clear teshabu in that to people who have corrupt beliefs and it's known to be their symbol, they will leave it because we don't want to do teshabu for them. But let's say, and it happened to me once, I was wearing a black thaw after a sermon, an individual lectures me full on. You should leave such clothing. You should be an example. How could you wear black? And I'm listening. And while I, I feel at that time that my words will be revenging for, my, for myself, I said, Akhi, is this something that is qala Allah, qala Rasulullah, based on the ijma' of the salaf, based on something that's certain and odd? He said, it's obvious. I don't know it. It's obvious to you, but to me it's not. Now let's say it's one of the doubtful matters. Let's say it. And especially as people who are looked up to, and people who address people, let's say, since it's that woman and leave it. Okay, my brother, with all my love and respect, what about the beard? Is it an obligation? Or is it a recommendation? Or is it a mubah? You know what happened? Wallahi, zipped his mouth, got angry, and walked off. Okay, subhanAllah. Are you advising me of that which is clear to me, it's halal. And when I advise you of that which is clearly Yani mentioned in the Sunnah to be a mask, he had a problem with me. But the point is, we don't want to be that individual that picks whatever he wants, chooses whatever he wants, and he's while he's not cautious of the major matters, the major topics. Person could be someone who doesn't even pray. Then the next thing that individual wants to be all cautious, he's going and saying, Yahi, don't buy from that butcher. Halal, no problems. 
No problems what you said, my brother. But you're contradicting your state. Someone like you is going to be that cautious and start talking. Shouldn't be in the state where he's living his prayer then. And it goes on, my brothers. So cautiousness is something good where a person doesn't make it to follow his desire and his whims. It's where it's done out of taqwa, piety. Where it's done with knowledge. Another example. It's proven through the Quran or through the Sunnah that so and so is the Sunnah. It's Sunnah, yachi, it's proven. He says, but I'm still doubt. Go, why? Because my madhab doesn't say that. My madhab doesn't state that. I'm not one of those people, by the way, who encourages any individual to go on to bad mouth the scholars of the Madhahib and their students. And I am against any individual who talks like that. And I say such individual should be silenced. The da'wah of Ahl Sunnah and the Salaf is to respect the people of knowledge and to give them the state that they deserve, the state that they deserve. But here we're talking about an issue where it's proven that there's a sunnah versus what he's accustomed to, all that which he's learned to be in the madhab. Tells you, I'm still doubt. Why are you doubt? It's proven to you. Qala Allah, qala Rasulullah. This is the understanding of the salaf towards this. And the, it's, it's, it's as clear as the moon on a dark night, my brother. Tells you, I'm still doubt. I won't do it. It's no issues there. But remember that here you're leaving what you're certain of to that which you're in. Doubt. This is a very dangerous one, my brothers. This is a very dangerous one. Another one, another example, the individual would not accept something to be, and he would not accept it out of cautiousness. Why? Because it, gets, it goes against his culture. It goes against his way of living. And you told him, Yaakhi, we're Muslims, alhamdulillah. And I don't, I don't doubt your Islam. I believe, inshallah, I believe you're a Muslim. According to what I see, you're a Muslim, ya I should not doubt you. But at the end of the day, I'm saying to you, qala Allah, qala Rasulullah, based on your understanding that is correct, which is applied to our time and place, it turns you back, it's not in my culture, not in my tradition. But ya we're talking about that which is certain. Now, again, this is leaving what you're certain about to that which you are in doubt about. Let's take another scenario, my brothers. Let's take another scenario. An individual will go on to reject an opinion. Reject it straight away. And the proofs are presented. Why? Now we spoke about the Madai. Now we're saying now because he didn't hear it from his chef. What a head. Seriously, what a head. Or let me give you another scenario. And this is something that I really find it's dangerous. Where there's an ijma, or not an ijma, let's say it has a saying by all by the majority of scholars. The little cat caught, the little, I don't want to say the words. Easily, easily rejects the ijma or the opinion of the majority, assuming it's wrong straight away. Why? Because it's in opposition to the hadith. Straight away. Without even learning what did they say about the hadith, what did they comment about it, without even understanding is it something that the sahaba, how did the sahaba take it or anything? This is something I find from my junior, junior, junior brothers. They go and listen to a talk on YouTube. They listen to a hyped up hip hop talk. And I mean it. And the next thing they think they're staunches. And they can go on to doubt matters as they wish. Why? Because they're learning now with certainty. What kind of a certainty is this? What certainty are you talking about? 
So understand my brothers, at the end of the day, leaving what you're in doubt of to that which you are not in doubt of is not a pick and choose game. But it's a state that a person lives. It's a state where a person applies in his life and it has its understanding, it has its rulings. But then another thing that I would like to say, at times we have our brothers having this mentality of just leave it. Why? It's doubtful. Yeah, it's doubtful to you. To you it's doubtful my brother. To me it's nowhere near doubtful. To me it's black and white. To you, it's up to you my brother. You do not have a right my brothers in such topics where it's not clear black and white. To go and dictate to people what to think and believe when they are following with that an understanding that is valid. Or at least that is given by people of understanding and knowledge. This is an important one. Yeah, just because you're in doubt doesn't mean that you have the right to go and dictate to the world to be in doubt. And this is where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Al-halalu bayin, wal-haramu bayin, wa baynahuma umurun mushtabihat, la ya'lamuhunna kathirun min al-nas. The halal is clear, the haram is clear, and in between are matters that are not clear. Not many people know about it. But when he said not many people know about it, it indicates what? The knowledge of it is known to people. And they can speak about it. And they know what they're talking about. So understand this too. And I hate it, I hate it, I hate it when our brothers just insist on being ignorant. Really, knowledge is something that we are commanded to seek. It should be a state that we live constantly to seek knowledge. So therefore, we should really go on to always find what will put, at, put us at certainty. Always go and learn so that you can become certain and certain and certain and certain. Look at this one. Talking to a brother. Actually, sorry, my apologies. He brings up the topic to me. <laughs> What's the ruling of so and so? My answer, I was taught to begin with that which is certain. Qala Allah, qala Rasulullah. And then if there's any room to differ, I will tell them and the scholars did differ about the understanding of this verse or this hadith. And the conclusion is one, two, three. It's my way of doing it. So I started like this. I said, no, nah, there's difference of opinion. Alright, I'm going to remove everything I said, I'm going to erase it all. I'm going to say what you just said now, there's difference of opinion. What's next? He's like, no, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, there's difference of opinion. Okay, what's next? Was I ordered to go and look for difference of opinion? Was I, to go, was I ordered to go and search and keep on searching to be more and more in a state where there's difference of opinion? Yes, you are required as a student of knowledge to widen your understanding. To be that individual who can understand causes and reasons for differences and know how to deal with it and know how to tackle it from its sources. That's, that's what we should be aspiring to reach. But not go on to just look for differences and not know how to deal with it and not know what the reasons of the differences are and so on. Yani, the aim, the aim isn't to learn that there's difference of opinion. No. That's not the aim. The aim is to learn how to get out of difference of opinion. How to not be in doubt. At the same time, how to deal with the person who opposes you. So the aim is not to reach that level where you can say there's difference of opinion. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing special about it. There. So this is the hadith about leave what you're in doubt of to that which you are not in doubt of. And it goes on to not only your religious matters, your worships, but it goes on to everything in life. You could say, you could look at an individual, he's a Muslim, prays, 
He's one, two, three. You can't go and assume things about him as you wish. The next thing you're accusing your brother without any evidences, without any allowances to do so. No, you leave what you're in doubt of to that which you're not in doubt of. You can't judge individuals based on what you can't see. You, base them, you judge based on what you can see. Something incredible from Rasulullah Why didn't he go on to kill the hypocrites? Believe me, he was able to kill them all, one by one. And he knew them. But one beautiful thing he said, and people at times stop at the surface of what he said and don't really understand in depth what he meant. He said, دَعْهُمْ لِأَلَّا يَقُولَ النَّاسِ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا يَقْتُلُ أَصْحَابًا Leave him so that people don't say Muhammad kills his companions. People, you ask him, but why didn't he kill him? Why didn't he kill the, the, the hypocrites? So, so that people don't say that he kills his companions. That's what, that's what Rasulullah pretty much said, but do you understand exactly what he meant? What he what really meant is that a judge, what's derived from it, you can say, is that a judge can only judge with what is apparent, not by what he knows. Meaning, that he may know something, but if he can't prove it in the evidences presented, then he can't rule by that. person might know for sure, for sure, for sure that he is guilty, but he can't prove it. What did Islam tell you? Let's say, with the issue of zina. What did Islam say about the lady who, or the lady that's caught cheating on her husband? Said you have to present evidences. Like what if you can't present evidences? What, what, were, you, what were you commanded to do? You can separate if you want. But you can't go on to accuse her of zina. Why? Present your evidences, otherwise you'll be lashed. You'll be, you'll be the one who's going to be now punished because you are accusing her without evidence. But what if he knows it? I know for sure. Prove it. <laughs> Prove it. So the point is, you find it in the Sharia. Al-bayyinah ala al-mudda'i wal-yameenu ala man anka. Al-bayyinah, the, the evidence is required, is required to be brought by the one who's making the claim. And the one who's denying, he is required to swear by Allah that he's truthful. The point is, evidence has to be presented. When we have, look at the seerah of the Prophet, look at the seerah of the companions, you find that. So, this is something that we apply even in our lives with people. That we leave what we're in doubt of to that which we are not in doubt of. Now.